Would you pray with me, please? Be with us this morning, God. Quiet our hearts. May our spirits be still that we might hear from you. Amen. It is Mary who first sees the risen Jesus and then begins to proclaim to others what she has just seen. Then later that same night, certain other disciples see the risen Jesus. And once they do, they, like Mary, begin to proclaim this astonishing news to others, most notably to their friend and fellow Jesus follower, Thomas. Thomas, though, upon hearing his friend's proclamation, responds to them by saying, unless I see, I cannot believe such an outrageous story. And so go the order of events in John chapter 20. Now, as we all know, Thomas soon enough does see the risen Jesus, at which point he too begins to proclaim this astonishing news himself. But that's not the aspect of this passage that I want to draw our attention to today. Instead, I want to draw our attention today to an aspect of this passage that I believe is far too often overlooked, and that aspect is this. When Thomas responds to these men and women with whom he has spent the last three years following Jesus, that unless he sees the risen Jesus himself, he cannot, like them, believe and proclaim such a story. Upon telling them this, he nonetheless remains every bit as committed to the way of Jesus as ever he was before, just as he remains every bit as committed to this group of Jesus followers as ever he was before, even though he can't fathom how they can possibly believe such a story. Do you follow that? He doesn't leave their group. He doesn't break away. He doesn't seek out new community. He just can't go with them there on that. Meanwhile, for their part, these other disciples don't scold Thomas for his lack of belief. They don't disfellowship him. They don't ostracize him from the community. They just now hold a conception of Jesus that is not entirely in keeping with Thomas's. Now, perhaps this might seem like a small detail, but it is, in fact, a very important point. So let's look closely at the text so we can tease out the details. According to verse 24, it is the same night of Jesus' appearance to the other disciples when Thomas confesses to them his doubt. But then, according to verse 26, it is, quote, A week later, a full week later, when the risen Jesus reveals himself to Thomas. A full week. And while most attention is usually given, and rightly so, to Thomas's sudden profession of faith in this moment, to his powerful confession, my Lord and my God, I want us instead to focus today on these three little words that precede it, a week later. A week later. There's so much lurking just underneath these three little words. There's so much for us to learn about faithfulness and committedness as Jesus followers and about the expansive and adhesive nature of Christian community. Look closely. According to John chapter 20, for an entire week, there are some members of the group who believe in the resurrection of Jesus, while at least one member doubts it. But meanwhile, and here is the item of central significance, meanwhile, the one who doubts it remains utterly committed to the way of Jesus, 
while those who believe it continue to accept the one who doubts it, just as they continue to consider him to be every bit as central to the group's health and identity as they did before. Are you following this? I hope so, because here's why this is important. Something we absolutely have to understand. Not everyone drawn to Jesus of Nazareth believes him to be the historically resurrected one. Which is to say, to this very day, there are countless Jesus followers who, like Thomas, are staunchly committed to the way and to the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth, but who nonetheless find themselves doubtful concerning his literal resurrection from the dead. Some in this sanctuary right this moment. Why doubtful? Because the thought of someone dead coming back to life is quite understandably a difficult thing to believe. For let's face it and let's name it. It is an outrageous proclamation, this Christian confession. And one cannot force oneself into believing anything. This is a universal truth. There is nothing more Baptist than acknowledging that. Consequently, there are folks deeply drawn to the historical Jesus who are willing to give their lives, their very lives, to the cause of living like Him and to working for the kingdom of God that He so convincingly proclaimed, but who then stop short of confessing a belief in His resurrection. Because such folks just can't in good conscience pretend they believe that. And to the point of this sermon, we as Christian community need to be able to affirm and need to be able to make space for this fact rather than try to impose upon such sincere and committed Jesus followers such an unfair expectation. Now I am hardly breaking new ground when I say that we live in a culture that feels very anxious about and around those who don't see things the exact same way that we ourselves do. Thus, we increasingly silo ourselves off from people who see and who think and who act and who live differently than we do. We form echo chambers of groupthink finding comfort in the uniformity of our perspective and our beliefs. Meanwhile, as we do, we quite naturally then come to feel more and more threatened by the presence of anyone who happens to see things differently than we do. This is true of us politically. It is true of us culturally. It is true of us socially. And yes, it is true of us theologically. But here's the thing. When it comes to church community, which is to say when it comes to a band of people earnestly and sincerely trying to follow Jesus, we do well to remember that we have not been called together by the Holy Spirit to become more and more like one another. Instead, we have been called together by the Holy Spirit to become more and more like Jesus. Instead, we have been called together to root our lives in Jesus' way and teachings and to care for and to look after one another in all manner of sickness and health and joy and grief and to aim our shared life toward the kingdom of God on earth that Jesus proclaimed. And then after that, we are called to leave the rest of it up to the risen Jesus Christ himself. Think carefully about this. It wasn't the disciples' repeated insistence on Jesus' resurrection from the dead that finally prevailed upon Thomas and caused him to believe in John chapter 20. And it certainly wasn't an overt or implicit threat of ostracism that caused him to exclaim, My Lord and my God. Instead, it was his continued belongingness to and in their group and then the sudden and the surprising revelation to him of the risen Jesus 
Jesus himself. Oh, dear family, there is a lesson for us in this. We have long assumed as the Christian church, the Christian church worldwide, that life together unfolds like this. That first we believe, and that after that we behave, and that finally after both of these things we belong. Believe, behave, belong. And hear me clearly, there is nothing at all wrong with this paradigm of church engagement. Many people do indeed enter into church fellowship in this way. But for the many who do enter this way, there are likewise plenty of others who follow a reverse paradigm. By which I mean there are plenty of others who are first drawn to the nature of the community. That is to say, to the sense of belongingness that the community offers. Then inspired by their sense of belonging, by the welcome and the love and the care of the community, they then quite naturally and of a course begin to behave in ways inherent to the community, which is to say they begin serving and caring and praying and worshiping together and doing all sorts of other things that are part of the ethos of the church community. And then and only lastly do they perhaps find themselves coming to believe central tenets of the faith, even though they've belonged to the faith community for quite some time. In short, some of us who confess Jesus Christ is Lord are like Mary, which is to say believing quickly, behaving in accordance, belonging on its account, while others of us are more like Thomas, belonging despite our doubt, behaving because of how grateful we are to belong, Perhaps believing finally when least we ever expected to believe. The point here being this. Both paradigms are biblical. Both are faithful. And both therefore need to be affirmed and made space for as ways of honoring a shared confession that Jesus Christ is Lord. Two weeks in a row now, I have teased out the significance of the statement, if the resurrection happened. For an if, as I have said each week, is always followed by a then. Well, in closing, for the purposes of this sermon, I want to offer this to our ongoing refrain of if, then. If the resurrection happened, then the risen Jesus can reveal himself to anyone he wants, any time he wants, anywhere he wants, anyhow he wants. From which follows this. If the resurrection happened, then the onus is not ultimately on us to convince others of its reality. Instead, the onus is on the risen Jesus to do this himself, just as he did for Thomas, and just as he did for Mary and the other disciples, and just as so many of us would say he has done for us. Now make no mistake, dear family, and do not miss here. I believe Jesus rose from the dead with every fiber of my being. I believe it in the same way that Mary believed it and in the same way that the disciples soon after her believed it. What's more, I likewise believe that we who do believe it are called to proclaim it proudly and boldly and unashamedly as Mary and the disciples did. But I also recognize that not everyone has experienced this reality in a manner that has felt to them as demonstrable and as captivating as it has for me. And so, like Mary and like the disciples soon after her, I continue to proclaim what I have experienced and what I take to be the very ground of truth. 
But all the while in so doing, I continue to belong and to behave with all manner of others who, in response to a proclamation like mine, say like Thomas in effect said, we too think that Jesus is Lord. But unless his resurrection is revealed to us in a manner as demonstrable as you say it has been to you, we just can't help but doubt it. And so again then to the point of this sermon, if the resurrection happened, then we as Christian community have to be okay with such variance of belief. In fact, if the resurrection of Jesus happened, then we have to intentionally make space for that. For if the resurrection of Jesus happened, then there's no telling how or when or in what manner the mysteriously risen one may impress himself on the lives and on the hearts of those whom he calls by name, which is all of us. In him we live and move and have our being. We are all his offspring. And moreover, if the resurrection of Jesus happened, then we who call Jesus Lord, despite our differing understandings of what exactly this means, are called to keep meeting together in loving and faithful fellowship just like those disciples were doing in John chapter 20 all the while in so doing leaving it up to the risen Jesus to arrive in such a way that belonging and behaving might lead ever onward to greater and greater capacities for believing a week later an entire week later Later, oh dear family, the truly remarkable things that can happen when a community of diverse Jesus followers remains faithful to one another over an extended period of time. Oh dear family, the things in such case that can happen. My Lord and my God indeed. To which all God's people said, Amen. And I will now.